Hello, welcome today's, uh, to today's Insightful Leader Live webinar. I'm Jess Love, Editor-in-Chief of Kellogg Insight. I'm going to be your host today. Thank you so much for joining us. I couldn't possibly be more excited to talk about thriving in the age of AI with Professor Hatim Rahman. Before I introduce him, I want to plug our January webinar. This is going to be with Victoria Medvek. If you've ever been curious about what it takes to join a board, that webinar will be invaluable. Professor Medvek is going to walk us through how to become board ready, how to evaluate different opportunities, and then pitch yourself. So that is going to be on Thursday, January 11th. It noon. She's an incredible speaker. Um, that registration page is already available um, on our website, and we'll drop a link to it at the end of the talk. But don't go now, or you might get kicked out of this Zoom event, and you don't want that to happen. Um, we are going to keep the chat box open today. That's going to let you kind of respond to each other and to some of the prompts from our professor today. Um, but we still do ask that you put your questions in the Q&A box. That's a lot uh, more sane for us to monitor. And it also lets you upvote each other's questions. Uh, closed captioning is available. You can access it via live transcript at the bottom of the screen. And this event will be recorded. Everyone who registered is going to get an email with a link to the recording in the next day or so. Um, without any further ado, let's get started. We are going to talk about AI today. With recent advances in artificial intelligence, um, you know, there, there's just uh, an, an incredible amount of buzz. Um, and whether some of these advances excite you or make you nervous or some combination of the two, uh, the only thing that is clear is you probably can't just ignore it all. So today we're going to talk about what's hype, what's not, and what we need to know as both individuals and organizations uh, to prepare for this world where AI plays a bigger role in our workplaces. Um, our presenter today is Professor Hatim Rahman. He is an assistant professor of management and organizations at Kellogg, where he studies how AI and the underlying algorithms that, uh, that, that create AI impact the nature of work. He's also written a book on this topic called Inside the Invisible Cage, which is scheduled to be published by the University of California Press in August of 2024. So welcome, Professor Rahman. Thank you so much for the uh, introduction. And I just want to give a shout out to the Insight team. A lot of work goes into uh, putting these together and we all benefit from them. So thank you so much to Jess and the team. So I am going to go ahead and share my screen so we can get started. Hang on here. Uh, are we looking good, uh, Jess, for the screen sharing? All right, fantastic. Um, so today's topic, as I said, I'm very excited to, to tell you more about is how to thrive in the age of AI. And to get us started, I wanted to start with this initial question. How many jobs in the U.S. have been replaced by technology since 1950? So a little bit of a trivia question, but one that I think is important to start out with. So you can drop your answers in the chat or try to think about it. So how many jobs, again, in the U.S. have been replaced by technology since 1950? And so, you know, I, I, I'm going to move to the answer because hopefully, again, you've thought about it or put your response in the chat. But it turns out that just one of the 270 jobs listed in the 1950 census has been eliminated by automation. And in case you're wondering, that job was an elevator operator. So sorry to all the elevator operators who were there at that time. So the reason I'm bringing this up is to first head on address some of the fear that AI and technology are going to suddenly lead to mass unemployment. Decades of research shows that fear is unfounded. I want to present another example to illustrate this point. So think about pilots in the uh, airline industry. So for decades now, the software to automate much of pilot responsibilities has existed. And it's only gotten better over time, taking over more and more. Some estimates indicate that 90 to 95%, if not more, of a pilot's responsibilities can be automated. 
Despite this technology existing for decades and improving, pilots have not disappeared. In fact, in aggregate, the number of pilots and their pay has increased for years. Why is that? And I'm using this to illustrate one of these central insights that I hope will be conveyed now and build upon throughout the rest of the talk today. So AI and technology fundamentally reflects and amplifies individual, organizational, and societal values and priorities. In other words, a technology's features, no matter how advanced they are, never independently predicts its impact on automation, on our jobs, on, or whether or not we can thrive. So connecting back to the example that I mentioned, pilots are still expected to train and learn how to do all the responsibilities manually because pilots themselves, organizations, and societies still value and prioritize pilots being able to manually operate an airplane if a, if a situation goes awry. Um, one other example to illustrate this point. So it wasn't that long ago when eBooks came out and everyone at the time was predicting the demise of print books, especially new books. You know, no one's gonna print them, no one's gonna buy physical books, it's all going to the cloud, so on and so forth. But now emerging research that has looked at the long-term trend shows that the, digiti the digitization of books has led to an increase in physical book sales. And, and we'll, we'll, pro we'll provide a lot of these links after the talk. This is just one recent paper that looks at it. And I'm not gonna go into detail right now, but going back to the point about how our values and priorities influence heavily the extent to which a technology is going to be implemented and the extent to which we thrive, it turns out many people still have a strong preference for holding, storing, and gifting physical books. You know, I mean, the joke you make is, when's the last time you e-gifted or a book, or you gifted an e-book, right? Usually you, you gift a physical book. And when thinking about our values and, and our priorities, they will ultimately determine the extent to which we thrive in the, in the age of AI. And I think what often gets missed in this discussion is thinking about the scale and scope of AI. So I'm going to I'm going to present a little bit of a graph here to bring in some much needed nuance to thinking about AI in society, organization, so on and so forth. So on the x axis, I'm thinking about the scale, so the number of people using the, the AI, and on the y axis, I'm thinking about the scope the number of people affected by the use of AI. And I'm gonna provide some examples to illustrate this point. So on the bottom left-hand quadrant, think about one person, so small scale, small scope, one person using AI for their leisure or trying to see how it could impact their personal productivity. On the top left-hand quadrant, think about small scale, but large scope. So one person being able to impact many people. So the tech CEO or the CEO of Google and Apple and Microsoft, OpenAI, so on and so forth, the, the CEO of those companies, the decisions that they make, what values and priorities they have affects a large scope or a large number of people. And then on the bottom right-hand quadrant, think about one organization in a confined scope. So small, um, larger scale, but smaller scope. So in as in an organization with many people using AI internally, in that example, if they're using it for the internal processes, it might be a, many people in an organization, but the scope is confined within itself. And then just to complete the diagram here, on the type right, right hand corner, you can think about large scale and large scope. So think about governments, international organizations, the priorities, the standards, the decisions they make 
the number of people it can affect. And because I am an academic, I'm going to add a third dimension. So the third dimension, which I think is very important, is to think about impact. And again, I'm going to talk through an example, uh, but but don't worry, we're not we're not going to go beyond 3D here. No no 4D today. But the reason why I think it's very important to think about impact is because it brings in the very real conversation about benefit and harm of AI. So thinking about it again, uh, um, adding impact to scale and scope, on the bottom left-hand quadrant, you can think about a student who uses a large language model. Now they could use it in their homework to provide an explanation after they make an attempt to answer a question. So provide the reasoning for why they got the question right or wrong. But the same individual could also use a large language model to cheat on their homework, right? And then just to provide the other extreme, on the top right-hand quadrant, governments, international agencies, their priorities and values are defining whether or not to prioritize AI to address climate change or for military applications, right? And the point of this is that our conversations about how we can thrive in the age of AI are situational. Depending on the scope, scale, and impact of AI. And these details do matter and are subjective. And I think a lot of times in our conversations about AI, these details are either thrown away from the side or not brought in, but they do matter because it reflects again and amplifies our values and priorities. And so one research, uh, one insight that research suggests and how we can optimize for scale, scope, and impact is thinking about how humans and AI can collaborate with each other rather than compete. And so this is the, the insight that I wanted to mention is that a lot of research has shown in the past and currently that to get the most, to really thrive in the age of AI, we need to be thinking about human AI collaboration rather than competition. And again, that's gonna come through what we value and prioritize. So that may sound great in the abstract, but how, how can we achieve that? And of course, I, I'm happy to talk about this more in the Q&A, but I'm gonna share at least one insight that comes out of my own research, and that's that research that is led by some of my PhD students. So the one thing that I want to impress upon, at least right now, is that your expertise and voice are critical for thriving in the age of AI. Because without diverse voices and stakeholders, the design and implementation of AI has and will reflect a very narrow group of people and interests that can perpetuate existing biases and harms, right? And so really one of the ethos of my research and teaching is thinking very carefully, how can we bring in your expertise and voices earlier and more consistent? And so again, this is a very multifaceted point, but I'm going to share what I hope are more practical advice of how this can happen. And so what I'm broadly phrasing this is, is that it's super important for diverse voices and expertise to be asking the right questions, which again, my research and those led by my PhD students is often very overlooked and obscured. Right now, a lot of the way we talk about AI is a hammer looking for a nail. Here's large language models. How can we use it? But I don't think that approach is going to help us thrive. Instead, we should be thinking first and foremost about what outcome is the AI trying to measure, predict, or generate? And very relatedly, should we use AI to make such predictions? So this is where, again, we need diverse voices and experts in the room to be answering this question. So to make this example more concrete, there's been a lot of discussion about how AI should be integrated into higher education. Should we use AI to help in the application process? Should it predict how likely a student should be admitted into a university? Should it predict how likely are they gonna pay tuition? 
again, what should we use the AI for and should we be using it? And I hope those hypothetical, I mean, they're actually not hypothetical. Those questions and conversations are happening right now that we would want students part of that conversation. We would want historically marginalized groups part of that conversation. Um, relatedly, let's say you determine, okay, yes, we need to use AI in some form in higher education, in your organization, or I want to use large language models. Even if you're not involved in the design and the use side, it's really important to think through in a perfect world, what type of data would we need to produce the outcome that AI is trying to generate, right? Um, because of this next question, what type of data can we actually collect and how will these data be collected? Usually you'll find there's a big discrepancy between what in a perfect world, what type of data do we need to predict or use an AI to feel confident about its output? And then what type of data can it actually collect? And how are you going to actually collect those data? Can you collect those data in a way that's ethical, or a way that's fair, that in a way that doesn't harm the environment? Again, I think all those questions are often taken for granted when we just think about how can um, AI solve a problem. Um, and then as I articulated here, but important to distinguish is what I mentioned, what are the differences and what are the biases, limitations, and consequences of these differences? So I'm going to, um, uh, I was going to bring this uh, example later, but I can mention it now. There's been a lot of cases in the news talking about, for example, in the legal profession, judges reprimanding lawyers for using chat GPT to create their briefings. Uh, because it hallucinates and creates false citations and incorrect information, right? So if you think about it, uh, you know, just to, in a more nuanced way, you know, maybe the, the lawyer thought that it could write a brief or they tested it, but not really thinking in, uh, more deeply that these the data that these systems collect is limited, especially in its ability to generate citations, for example. Um, and then just two more that, that I'll illustrate that I think are very important that I mentioned earlier is that even if you build an AI model, there are situations and circumstances when you should not be using the AI model. And this is a big discussion that's happening, but again, in which your voice and expertise in your domain is critical. You know, I can't answer how AI could be should be used to train, you know, um, new law students in, in, in law school, right? We need lawyers involved in that discussion or new or physicians, so on and so forth. And then relatedly, if you're going to use AI to automate a process, at what point should the human be in the loop? When can a human intervene so that they can override the AI system, so that they can provide their own situational expertise and judgment? And then the other thing that often gets missed in this critical to thinking about how to thrive in the age of AI is how can we provide transparency and accountability for relevant stakeholders and audiences? So one other example that I'll give to illustrate this point is that AI systems are, are now being used to determine whether or not people should be obtain a credit card, get a loan, so on and so forth. And if you're denied a loan or a credit card, a lot of people want to know why that is. And there's good reason. Past research has shown that a lot that prior data can systematically discriminate against women, immigrants, so on and so forth, right? So thinking very carefully about even if you implement an AI model to how can you provide transparency and accountability that promotes fairness and accountability. Okay, so the other thing that I wanted to mention that I think helps answer this question is the research that kind of shows what humans ex excel in and what AI and machines are um, have weaknesses in, because it helps answer the question about how can we get the ideal combination of human AI collaboration. So broadly speaking, humans excel in creativity and innovation, emotional intelligence, adapting to emergent situations and learning, right? So the classic example is, is that generally for toddlers, if you show them one picture of a dog, they can rep they can recognize thousands of species of dogs, right? 
um, or, or an animal. Whereas a machine, you have to put tons of examples in order for it to accurately and precisely learn those situations. And then moral and ethical judgments, it's not that necessarily humans excel in this regard, but these decisions have to come from our values and priorities. And then conversely, AI tends to excel with efficiency and speed and the scale in which it can be implemented. The amount of data it can store and recall far exceeds humans. And then the physical capability is meaning that generally speaking, AI doesn't get tired or bored in the same way humans do, right? So I think these, the, like seeing these laid out also can help in your specific domain and expertise, figure out the right combination of human and AI collaboration. And the other reason why I wanna emphasize that your expertise and your experiences are critical is the next insight, which often gets missed in our discourse. There is nothing inherently artificial or intelligent about artificial intelligence. And I'm gonna use generative AI and large language models to illustrate this point, hopefully very cleanly and convincingly, but I'm open to, to, question, to the Q&A in the chat to talk more about this. So large language models has been trained on our data that we have contributed on the web through a book, so on and so forth. And this has brought up concerns about copyright violation, right? So it also reflects, again, that companies that have trained their models on these data, their values and priorities in terms of training the data and how they're approaching the situation. And it's an open question about how well these models would perform if it didn't have access to our human-generated content. Secondly, in terms of showing how it's not it, it, artificial intelligence is not artificial by any means whatsoever, is that these models currently consume a lot of natural resources. So you can see in the bottom right-hand corner, this came out just a couple of days ago, that currently making an image with generative AI uses as much energy as charging your phone. Now, that will likely decrease over time, no doubt, but we should keep in mind and think about to you know if we value and prioritize these concerns how much energy is being consumed in training and using using these models and again what should we prioritize and the other thing that i wanted to mention that combines how it's not very artificial intelligence is that these models in these companies have used lower paid and outsourced a lot of the work to fine tune these models so this has been widely reported and consistently documented that OpenAI and many other large companies use Kenyan workers on less than two um, dollars per hour to make chat GPT less toxic, right? So again, a lot of research, including my own, has shown that these systems are heavily, heavily reliant on human intervention. One other point, just to emphasize this point about how it's not inherently um, artificial or intelligent, you can, it's it's actually quite interesting. And again, in the q and I can talk more about this. Is uh, two days ago, I put this in preparation for the presentation. I asked uh, GPT-4, in case those are those who are wondering, the, um, the advanced version, what is the fifth word in the sentence in which I'm asking you about? And this response was, the fifth word in your sentence is the which is actually the third word in the sentence. And you can try this out on your own. And uh, if you ask ChatGPT this question repeatedly, it will give you a different response. And, I, and I'm gonna give you a little bit more insight for why this is, but you know, kind of simple questions like this hopefully reinforce that these models are not inherently artificial or intelligent on their own. Um, so on that note, since it's in the discourse, I wanted to spend a few moments thinking and talking a little bit more about what does emerging research indicate about generative AI and what does that mean for thriving in the age of AI? So as I, the, the last example illustrate, illustrate is that generative artificial intelligence fundamentally relies on speculative probabilistic algorithms, meaning that the output it generates 
is coming from a probabilistic distribution in which the model doesn't understand the output that it's producing. What that means is that the output requires ver verification, especially if the scale, scope, and impact are consequential, right? So the example I gave earlier, a lawyer submitting a brief to the court, you're gonna wanna verify the content <laughs> before you submit that brief, right? Um, whereas if you're you're just playing around with it on your own, you probably won't pay as much attention to it. But the point is, is that because it relies on speculative probabilistic algorithms, the output as we currently stand will always need verification. And then my one of my colleagues just released an excellent paper, which again, shout out to Kellogg Insight. They've already released, I believe, an article in a podcast about it. Um, has shown, and in, in this is not the only study, there are other emergence, emerging studies that have uh, documented this, is that large language models, over time, they tend to produce very homogenous content that can perpetuate biases in the data. So I'm talking about current scale. Of course, no one can perfectly predict the future. There, there are a lot of efforts to try to address this, but as it is right now, and I've seen this as an educator as well. I know, I, I mean, I can tell with great certainty when students are using generative AI because it produces very similar answers um, to, to questions that I provide students. Okay, and again, that may or may not be consequential depending on the scale, scope, and impact. Um, I did, I, I mean, I do wanna highlight there are specific use cases in which generative AI is showing it can help so some research shows that it can help with coding, looking for errors, debugging code, providing feedback on iteration, on ideas in your writing, so on and so forth. So I'm not diminishing whatsoever that there are going to be use cases, but I did wanna highlight that past research shows that the macro impact of generative AI on our economy and our occupations and careers is uncertain. And so the reason why that's the case is because of one, again, one insight that I'll share with you is that, you know, uh, uh, academics are really good with coming up with new, uh, not necessarily new, but different ways to measure outcomes of interest. And so one outcome of interest that people are interested in is how do we isolate the impact of technology on productivity? So net of other factors like education, so on and so forth. And so one of the most used measures is called total factor productivity, which again is trying to isolate the impact of technology on productivity. And so you can see from 1950 to 1974, um, when manufacturing was scaling in our economy, you can see what it was over there. And again, I don't wanna go into too much detail right now, but I did wanna put it in context. So since then, the closest we've gotten to reaching the, pro the, the macro impact of manufacturing was the dot-com leading up to the dot-com bubble. And you can see it was a bubble, right? <laughs> you can see the drop off from 2004 to 2005 to 2009. And if you look at from 2005 to essentially where we are today, with the scaling of the internet, Google, uh, Microsoft Bing, Ask Jeeves, if you remember that, um, smartphones, so on and so forth, we have yet to reach that, that level of pro productivity. And again, I, I, mean, I can't cover all the research on why that's the case, but just some insights is that the more complex the technology, the more technical human and monetary resources are needed to develop, integrate, and maintain technology and AI uh, in an organization. And if you ask many people in IT, it can be a nightmare just trying to figure out compliance for new technology, right? It takes time, the more complex the technology is. Um, so that generally means that for generative AI included, it's going to take time for it to penetrate an industry, especially in ways that will affect your career. In, in particular, fine tuning generative AI requires significant resources. It's not a coincidence that the most well-resourced companies are the ones who have spent at least a decade fine-tuning these models, and it's just now coming out um, to, to the broader public. So with that in mind, I actually think, the reason I, I think I'm actually excited about this is because I think there is a lot of space 
for, again, our voices and expertise to shape how we can thrive with generative AI. And so I'm going to build on this point with an idea that I'm, I'm borrowing from, from my colleague at Princeton, Ruha Benjamin, who is a sociologist and professor of African American studies in at Princeton, who highlights that when we're talking about new technology, including with generative AI, we fall into a vision that is either very bright or very bleak, that again, doesn't, I think, accurately reflect our voices and expertise. And so I want to actually read these very powerful quotes that she made, and we'll share the link from the talk in which she, which she just recently released, that talks about what she calls us-topias. And I want us to really reflect on this idea. So she says, however loathsome or loving we are, so will we be. Whereas utopias are the stuff of dreams, dystopias the stuff of nightmares, us-topias are what we create together when we are wide awake. Us-topias invite us into a collective imagination in which we still have tensions, but where everyone has what they need to thrive. Utopias require inequality and exclusion. Us-topias center collective well-being over gross concentrations of wealth. They're built on an understanding that all of our struggles from climate justice to racial justice are interconnected, that we are interconnected. The first step is to stop policing the borders of our own imagination. A world without prisons, ridiculous. Schools that foster the genius of every child, naive. Work that doesn't drive us into the grave, impossible. A society where everyone has food, shelter, love, in your dreams. Exactly. So I invite us to collectively think, and this is why I emphasize that technology fundamentally reflects and amplifies our individual, organizational, and societal values and expertise. And it's critical for us, all of us, to be involved in this conversation early and consistently. So what does that mean also? Well, if, uh, one example that I thought about that is relevant for a lot of organizations when thinking about utopias is AI and hiring. And I often see the discourse going to the utopia dystopia vision. AI can replace hiring to save costs and efficiency. I think this very easily devolves or evolves to utopia dystopia. To me, an utopia version is how can AI help organizations find candidates that are systematically ignored or overlooked, either due to implicit or explicit bias, or because it's hard for humans to go through thousands of applications, or even for some organizations, millions of applications. It's impossible. But can we use AI to help us find and bring to our attention candidates that otherwise would have been overlooked? Okay, now I do want to leave time for Q&A, but I just want to give one plug to uh, some emerging research so that hopefully we can connect after this talk as well. So my version or my attempt to try to create an utopia in my research is thinking more about what organizations are doing to try to address uh, employment mobility. So for better or worse, employment remains the primary way people obtain mobility in our economy. So we've seen this. If you look in aggregate, going back to the earlier point, that technology doesn't overall replace jobs. It changes the nature and composition of jobs, but in aggregate, it creates a lot of jobs, right? We're not, the most of the people in the US are not farming, but there are a lot of jobs in the service economy, for example. But who can get these jobs and who gets access to them is critical to enabling more people to thrive in the age of AI. And so the reason this caught my attention is that there are organizations now that are trying to eliminate the requirement of a college degree. And the reason that's relevant for my research is that over 60% of, of adults in the US who are 25 or older do not have a college degree. And to the degree that they can also thrive in the future of work, they 
are going to have to be able to access these higher paying jobs that AI is creating. So my plug on the emerging research uh, side is if your organization is trying to help historic, people with a, without a college degree or other groups that have been historically marginalized get access to new jobs that are higher paying, please be in touch. Or if your organization is interested in being part of the solution, creating this Austopia on the employment side, I'd love to connect. Um, and then the last thing before we um, before uh, before we turn it over to the chat and Q and A, um, as I mentioned, uh, as just highlighted earlier, I do have a book coming out in August twenty twenty four, where a lot of the insights that I've shared today and that I go into a lot more detail in um, are going to come out in this book. It's empirically based on a case of how online labor markets are using algorithms, and uh, one thing that it cover it. it there's a chapter that talks about how we can predict the unintended long-term effects of new technology, right? It's easy to try to think about the short-term effects, uh, but it's a lot harder to try to predict the un, uh, unintended effects of new technology. So just as a preload, uh, one of the chapters in my book talks about it. And I know it's hard to, to read books, you know, even for professors, it's hard to read books um, nowadays. Um, but as we've seen from the research, we still really like physical books in our hand. Um, and this link is not to buy the book. Uh, it's not available to be bought right now, but it's to uh, register your interest. So when the book is available, I'll be able to, I'll be able to email you. Okay, so we'll leave it there and then we'll turn it over. All right. Thank you so much. This was absolutely fascinating. And what I'm really excited about is we still have a lot of time for a robust Q&A. So just a reminder to our audience, please drop that in the Q&A as opposed to the chat, which makes it a lot easier to monitor. Um, but I wanted to start with kind of a, a bigger question. Um, so there's a lot of uh, really, I think, empowering information for people about how we can kind of think about this moment in a way that is a little bit less, you know, utopian versus dystopian. But I think a challenge that people have, or that I've had is how to think about this in terms of like, what are the sort of practical steps we can take to, to feel like we have maybe a little bit more agency. Because I think a common response, and I've seen this in various polls, is honestly one of like helplessness. Like people don't feel like they have a lot of power to say, this is how it should be used in hiring, and this is how it should not be used. And certainly, you know, we're based in the US, I, I think most of us would agree that we don't have the most functional political system. Um, so how do you think about this and how do you maintain an upbeat attitude about the possibility of an utopia, given that you and I as individuals only have so much control? So I, this is why I presented the scale, scope and impact piece, right? Where we're sitting in our careers in, in our lives does vary, right? So I, I mean, personally, I don't think I'm going to be able to influence how physicians are going to use generative AI. Um, that's just not where I'm sitting for, for my impact. But I do think I can influence it in Kellogg, the, you know, the policies that, that we're putting forward. And so there are two ways to answer that question. One is that I would challenge all of us to think about there is scale, scope, and impact that you have. Maybe at the smallest end, how are you going to use it? Are you going to use it to try to learn new topics? Are you going to try to use it to, to for, for leisure? Are you, you know, so on and so forth. Um, and then I, I hope there are people on this call who are, who can influence people on the policy level. Um, now, you know, I guess now with social media and uh, in other ways, right? You can start your own sub stack, right? That, so I, I don't want to be so prescriptive and in, in to give a, uh, a one answer. Rather, I think that there are areas you can do so now. And secondly, if you want to try to influence it on the grander scale, well, it takes work, right? Like you're going to have to either try to get elected or or get a, get a PhD and like enter into that sphere. Um, so, but the, the good news on that part that I mentioned is that it's not gonna happen suddenly. It's going to take time for it to unfold. So to, to, and just to share a personal anecdote, one of the reasons I pursued a PhD is because I felt as a consultant in healthcare consulting, I kind of, I kind of call it 
my, my dark days, although uh, you know, just uh, uh, jokingly, is that I didn't feel like I could have the level of influence that I wanted. And so that spurred me to do a PhD because from my observation and my skill set, generally people with a PhD can still be appointed to the Federal Trade Commission, to governmental positions, right? In ways that people who don't have a PhD or a law degree, so on and so forth, um, are excluded from. So um, sorry, it's, it's a very situational answer, but on the ground, that's what I see. Yeah, and we actually had a couple of questions about that that kind of specifically got at access. And I'm, I'm curious if you have any thoughts about how we can ensure that access both to these technologies and to the opportunities that they provide and to the kind of discourse around shaping the, you know, the the rules of the game in terms of how these tools are used. Like, how can we uh, make this so that it is not just people with PhDs or law degrees that are sort of steering this conversation? Yeah, I do. I do think that through especially with, with, you know, to some extent with social media and other things like that, um, there, there is a lot of value in grassroots organization and people coming together and hearing their voice, at, even at the school board level, even at getting involved in local government, right? Like showing up to council meetings. So one thing that I'll, I'll emphasize, it does take work and effort. But if there, you know, as I say, if there, if there's a will and there's a way, and you know, one of my colleagues in my department, Braden King and others, they study what's called social movements, right? How is it that a group of people can come and pressure organizations, governments, so on and so forth, with their grassroots voice to influence uh, these policies? So, I, I would say that just. People, again, are passionate in different areas with different expertise and different, um, uh, given their experiences. And so just starting somewhere, even as I mentioned, like posting, trying to find other people who have similar interests um, is where to start. And then this is what excites me and I guess is a little bit scary about the future is that no one really knows what's going to happen, right? Um, what types of, even if you were to ask, seven or eight years ago, no one is predicting the United Auto Workers Union would be able to mobilize and strike, right? How do they do it? Well, I mean, again, you'd have to be situational and ask them how they're able to collectively do so, yeah. All right, so I am just gonna go through a grab bag of random questions. We're just gonna hit you at all sides, all right? Yep. Um, so this one's kind of interesting. How can individuals or companies think about differentiating themselves if everyone is using the same AI? That's a great question. One is to kind of going back to the questions I was I was mentioning, like really thinking very carefully about what is it that you want to accomplish? Do you want to become the cut costs? Do you want to uh, try to center diversity, equity, inclusion. So I think that's the first step. And then you can really figure out how you can differentiate yourself. But, you know, if a, a lot of times, especially as it relates with integrating AI, you need resources. In not, I'm not just talking about money. You need the right people. You need AI experts. You need subject matter experts all in the room. So I, I want to emphasize again that the, you know, there's been a lot of attention on open AI, and I know a lot of people who work in open AI. And I was in grad school when they kind of started. It required a huge, dedicated amount of times and billions of dollars to get to to where they were. So, I would I would just to take a step back. If you don't have access to that, I would think very carefully about what's feasible with the resources that you have. What do you want to prioritize? and then perhaps work backwards to see what's available. So we had a, a pretty interesting question, I think, about the effect of AI on human attention. Have you seen anything, uh, you know, in your in your perusal of the literature looking at, because I, I think we're coming off this moment where most of us will acknowledge that social media has, and certainly having a smartphone with us at all times has not been the best for our attention span. Um, are there any kind of 
people talking about how this could affect human attention. Sure, sure. And and let me let me just uh, there's one other thought that came up to the other question is that there is a lot of value in organizations just waiting. Um, so if you remember not too long ago, big data was like we were getting very similar questions like, do we all need to get certified in big data? But you know, Tableau and um, Power BI, right? So these these tools came to make it so much more easy and accessible for organizations to interact with big data. And I see a, something very similar going to unfold with the AI. Right now, we're in a very early stages, and there's going to be a lot more accessible tools that will allow smaller organizations to figure out how they're going to excel. Okay, so do, going to your question. So yes, research consistently shows that people tend to um, over rely on automation once they begin to interact with it. So we've so the the, the short answer is that the research on with, with with social media or even with autonomous vehicles is that once we begin to generate a little confidence, um, we begin to over rely on them and we don't combine human AI collaboration. We tend to um, over rely on them when we shouldn't. So think about spell check, right? A lot of us our spelling uh, capabilities have decreased, or even when you're reversing a car, um, there's some research that shows that, you know, uh, the our, our tendency to check our peripheral has decreased as we over rely on rear view camera mirrors. So the short end of it is, is that we tend to over rely on technology as we gain trust. And there's been a lot of discussion with my colleagues in computer science about how can we design people in these systems to force people to be more intentional and more thoughtful about it. And so one of my colleagues in, in the computer science department said his advice is treat everything generated from a large language model as false. Um, so that in his point of making that extreme example is that if you treat it by false and uh, by default, hopefully that will get people to look at the output more carefully. So speaking of treating the output of these models as false, we also have some questions about misinformation. These are going to require you to uh, look at your crystal ball and tell us what is going to happen. How are we going to make sure that literally everything we see on the web is not full of factual inaccuracies? Yeah. So, the, you know, in one of, one of my other slides, I ended up taking out the reason why I'm I'm really advocating for more diverse stakeholders within your situation to, to come forward and, and be a bit uncomfortable in asking these, these questions is because what we've seen consistently is that both the best and worst outcomes happen simultaneously. So going to social media, yes, it allows us to connect with everyone, but it also allows anyone to post unverified information. And so as it currently stands, I see disinformation, spam, so on and so forth, accelerating even further without additional guardrail, guardrails in place. So uh, as I said that, you know, we've seen this consistently, consistently with smartphones, with social media, and again, even with, with, with driving cars, people's, uh, you know, research has shown that people's attentiveness with driving decreases with all the amazing technology that's been integrated that both the best and worst outcomes are gonna happen simultaneously. So what my push is which one will happen is not preordained. It's really gonna depend on our own um, use case in our own voice. As I mentioned with, with pilots, right? Um, we don't have, it's, it's, it's really quite incredible to think about, I, I saw a recent statistic in one day over 3 million flights took off in the world without a single accident happening, right? Um, Um, so I do want to also ask, this was also upvoted, um, how much of the problems, let's say with accuracy, but also with other, um, issues that have come up, maybe bias, um, kind of homogeneity, how much of these are solvable with just more smarter, better AI? Yeah. I mean, so it's going back to the other question. It's not going to happen. So from, from the research that I've read and some of the experts is that the models themselves are not going to be able to solve these issues themselves. Rather, it's going to take human training 
human guardrails to implement it. So, you know, again, I've been following and I've been interacting. I've had access to some of the advanced models of, of large language models through these companies for, for many, many years. And the, the, the key differentiating factor is putting in human guardrails around these systems. So in, in fact, a lot of the underlying models that are being used by generative AI systems are not new. Uh, rather, it's been trying to figure out that human AI collaboration to um, solve these issues that are not solvable by purely technical means. So speaking of guardrails, then, what do you think of some of the various proposals that have been put forth? For instance, should there be some sort of oversight board for AI, whether that's a part of a national government or an international collaboration, or potentially, you know, looking at the EU's approach um, with their AI Act as sort of a an example of of, an, of what what's possible? Yeah. So, you know, again, I know this is a very academic answer, but it's true. Like. There isn't a one solution that's going to fit. I actually think in order for us to get to an optimal solution, all hands are needed on deck. We need we need what we call kind of open sourced, collective, just the uh, crowdsourced accountability as well. Um, there's so many times where you know people have brought up issues that companies, despite well intentions, haven't seen uh, been able to figure out. In addition to this, we also need oversight at the national level, at the state level, at the industry level, right? Uh, we do need industry partners to come together and come up with standards because they have expertise and resources that governments don't, that the crowd doesn't. So again, I know it, it's it's a bit of an academic answer, but I think it's very true here that we need all hands on deck to, to figure out the optimal way in which guardrails should be implemented in ways that doesn't stifle innovation, but still doesn't lead to suboptimal sub outcomes. A couple questions have come in about creativity, and I'll just kind of read a couple and, and you can share whatever thoughts you have. Yeah. Um, so certainly uh, AI was a part of a lot of the negotiations that took place with the Writers Guild of America. Um, it's also been a part of the SAG negotiations. So there is a lot of concern among creatives. You you also, of course, posted the um, copyright lawsuits that have started to come in. Um, so how is AI going to kind of get better at creativity in a world where creatives are sort of really mistrustful of using it? Do we want it to get better? Um, and then a, a related question is, is it really bad at creativity? Isn't it also just helping us come up with ideas that maybe are creative in a way we're not used to thinking about? Yeah, so answering the last question first, um, you know, it so it can help with, with, with creativity. Again, and, and it, it that's a very subjective thing, like what is creative or not, right? Um, do, do artists are artists innovative or are they recombining past work and past ideas, right? So I'm gonna leave that to each kind of uh, expert in their area to determine whether it helps or hurts with creativity. I can just say, speaking from, from my specific self-advantage, I haven't very found it very helpful for coming up with new research ideas because again, it relies on past data and research is a lot about pushing the envelope in ways um, that hasn't been done before. But that's not to say, again, this is an either or answer, right? There is gradation in, in the extent to which it helps. Um, I've heard entrepreneurs say that, you know, it's it's helped spur or it's, it's helped lower the activation energy to come up with ideas or it can help overcome roadblocks. So um, it's it's not a yes or no answer. And um, it, it does help, especially if it's trying to recombine past data in ways that, that haven't been done before. Can you remind me of the first question? Yeah. So the first question was sort of along the lines of, you know, if if we're viewing creativity as a potential limit, like a limitation of these models, and we have this sort of hostile environment where a lot of creatives are a little reluctant to use it, is that going to hurt its ability to kind of continue becoming more creative? Right. And maybe more broadly, how should yes. creatives be thinking about this technology? So, so it yes, the, the, the future of these systems is very uncertain. So for example, when I mentioned that it's been very helpful with coding, 
a lot of the data it was trained on is this website called Stack Overflow for those who are unfamiliar. But since some of Copilot, and again, you don't necessarily, not everyone needs to know these, but essentially since this generative AI system has come out to help with coding, the amount of submissions that have gone on to this publicly available repository has decreased dramatically. And so the extent to which it's going to be useful for future coding languages and so on and so forth is less certain. And some of my colleagues at New York Chicago have released a tool in which artists can poison an AI system. So if they if they use this AI tool and an AI system scrapes their image without their permission, it can poison the entire model, right? As a way to resist these models. So it's very it's heavily contested and it's gonna, again, depend on what we value and what we prioritize collectively. And as it has been with prior technologies, it's gonna be contested and it's going to depend on factors such as how powerful is an occupation, you know, how much say do they have over their um, over the entrance of a technology and how it's used. With your wonderful crystal ball that we've been relying on heavily tonight uh, or uh, today, do you think that artificial general intelligence or these AI systems that can potentially surpass humans are possible or imminent? No. So I, I, I you know, I, I, it was, it was interesting. So I've had, I've had a discussion about this in my class since 2020, and uh, you know, I, presenting different research and experts. You know, I show how it's not possible, and no, you know, to, to, from my vantage point, the experts who are involved in this, the, the scholars who are in, in here, uh, involved in this, have consistently said that it's, it's not possible. Um, but, you know, before Gen AI was coming, I was thinking about taking out the slide because it was so obvious, uh, but I'm, I'm going to keep it in, right? Um, but no, it's 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 not going to happen, um, certainly not in our lifetimes. Uh, of course, no one can perfectly predict the future, but I'm fairly confident that it's not, based on my own assessment and those of other experts, that we are not going to reach AGI. And I don't know, if, if I'm wrong, I don't know. I'll treat you to dinner. I don't know what what, what would be fun, but uh, you can hold you can hold me to that prediction. Uh, this is a this is an uh, an interesting one. If you can answer it really quickly, um, so I know there's a lot of data that's coming in about how AI is going to help people get rid of rote tasks and go straight to kind of those things that rely on human judgment. But what does that then do to our ability to kind of really understand the, the rudimentary skills that would have gone into that original uh, rote work? Yeah. So again, I want to push back on this point. So in math, calculators have existed for a long, long time. Last time I checked, around the entire world, curriculum still teach people how to add and subtract, right? So it, it's going to be situational in nature, but to your point that when we automate any task, we do lose skill in that in that task. So that is what, what, what I had a slide on this too, is that why your voice and expertise is needed. Like we need to determine that in different use cases. So, you know, again, when you take growing up and probably today as well, when you took a test, you could use your calculator and homework but when it came to taking a test in class, we've decided you can't use your calculator in that area and function. So the insight of the question is correct, that if you automate, you do lose skills. It is going to be up to us situationally, depending on scale, scope, and impact, and other factors that have come about, um, competition, culture, so on and so forth, that is going to determine the extent to which we automate and de-skill or retain those, um, those kind of lower level skills. Well, we are at time that totally flew. Thank you so much to Professor Hatim Rahman and to our excellent questions um, and everyone who asked them. I do want to also thank the folks behind the scene at the webinar for making this happen. Um, happy holidays and please join us in the new year to hear all about board membership. We'll drop links in the chat that include how to register for our next webinar and how to get Hatim's new book. Thank you so much. Take care.